This video is brought to you by Squarespace. We're gonna lose a piece of history, a piece of America. Cinematographers love the voodoo of it. Is it the end of film? We're being forced by the industry to upgrade to digital projection. In addition to being bigger, it's brighter, uh, the darks are darker, the contrast is better. It, even in film, the white and the black bleed together. In the new IMAX projection technology, you see the whites, you see the black. With the recent release of Oppenheimer and 15 perf 70 millimeter IMAX, the topic of the rarity of seeing a movie in film is a trending one, and it makes sense. Oppenheimer released to only 30 theaters worldwide in 70 millimeter IMAX film compared to Interstellar that released to 41 theaters just back in 2014. Could we be nearing the end of film in theaters, or does the success of Oppenheimer show that it may be on the verge of a renaissance? Our story really begins in 1997 when Sony and Panavision were partnered together to create the camera that would kickstart the famed Cine Alta line with the Sony HDW F900. And who was this camera for? None other than George Lucas and for his Star Wars trilogy. We were able to later on get a prototype camera and shoot a couple of scenes and bits of scenes, which I wanted to do because I wanted to see how well it matched into the film that we'd shot. Uh, and it matched in so well nobody ever noticed it. But that meant that I knew now that I had the cameras, I had the lenses, and I could shoot the next film uh, completely digitally and I wouldn't have to move back and forth between mediums. Digital is, I felt at that point, the quality was close enough to film that I wasn't going to end up with any less of an image. While George Lucas would only be able to use this first-of-a-kind digital cinema camera for The Phantom Menace for just a couple of scenes, shortly after, Star Wars Attack of the Clones would become the first movie filmed completely with digital cameras, and would begin a decade-long revolution in the cinema industry that would lead to an intersecting point between film and digital in 2012. The studios will soon only offer their films digitally. Making a film on celluloid and projecting it digitally is a very inferior image. It's hard to argue argue the fact that technology has caught up with us. It does nothing for me. I mean, I actually think I'm getting when I go to a movie and I realize it's either been shot on digital or being projected in digital. Since 2012, the use of film as a cinema medium has given way to the meteoric rise of digital cinema cameras that just keep getting better with every iteration. And this leads us to just last year, where according to IMDb, only five movies were really shot on film. Death of the Nile, The Northman, Bullet Train, Jurassic World Dominion, and Nope. Now we can likely connect the lower use of film for principal filming to the industry trying to get its legs underneath it after the pandemic. But even if that wasn't a factor, how many directors actually still prefer using film? There's something uh, about uh, capturing magic and putting it in a box and, and putting tangible confines around it that's intrinsic to the filmmaking process. So that I would never go back to 2D again. I would never go back to film and I would never go back to 2D. I was gonna be digital all the way, I was gonna be 3D all the way. Looking at the image on the screen that was coming from these cameras wasn't like watching a film. It was like looking through a window into a, into a reality. And if I could get that kind of power into my fictional film, I believed I could do something much more extraordinary than anything I had, had done in the past. It's hard to get a full sense of how many directors or cinematographers prefer using film still, but it's actually still quite a decent list full of some top filmmakers and directors. J.J. Abrams, Steven Spielberg, Christopher Nolan, Wes Anderson, Tom Cruise actually prefers it, Christopher McQuarrie, Hoyt Van Hoytima, Quentin Tarantino, and M. Night Shyamalan, and Rian Johnson. Now, there are plenty of other directors and cinematographers that are dedicated to using film cameras that we have not named here, so it's not a completely dead art, and it still lives on through many who love the look and the feel of film and the process of using it. In fact, back in March 2022, IMAX announced a new second generation of IMAX cameras that they were developing with Kodak, Panavision, and Photochem. The plan was to create an entire new fleet of IMAX cameras with the first batch set to arrive in 2023 and 2024. Jordan Peele and Christopher Nolan have both been reported to be among the group of advisors for construction of the updated camera line. But there seems to be a slight delay with these cameras, as recently it has been stated that it could be still several years away. And while this is a great sign, there is still one very apparent issue with this list. It's the age. Which a large part of this group of great filmmakers likely to retire in the next 20 years 
Well, the next generation of directors and cinematographers who did not grow up making movies with film cameras, but with digital cameras, still decide on using film over digital? Will they actually decide on a more difficult path of committing to film with its expense and tediousness? I will be one of the last guys shooting film, and Chris Nolan will be one of the last directors shooting film. Getting a film onto the big screen is difficult, and it costs a pretty penny. Beyond having to produce the film in the first place, it needs to get distributed to hundreds of venues with different licensing agreements, first party versus third party publishers, and the difference between digital and analog distribution, making the price of the delivery fluctuate. First off, acquiring the footage, Kodak provides catalogs to their customers, breaking down the costs of a film reel, with prices depending on what film format is ordered. Well, 50 feet of Super 8 film, for instance, only costs $32. Prices quickly ramp up when deciding to opt for higher per film, with 400 foot 35 millimeter color negative film costing roughly $317, and the same length of 65 millimeter film costing around $619. Considering the 15 per 70 millimeter film reel for Oppenheimer came in at 11 miles, or 50,080 feet for the final cut of the movie, it's a little crazy to consider what it would have cost using film for principal filming that was likely way beyond. This of course doesn't include the cost of developing the film photochemically, for which the director would need to send in reels to a Kodak laboratory. Then comes distribution, with movies naturally being delivered on reels, which can cost a couple of thousands of dollars per print. The reels would also need to be delivered to theaters and the delivery costs can skyrocket depending on the format as well, with Oppenheimer's film reel reportedly being close to 600 pounds. Not to even mention that IMAX has had to pay for projectionists to set up and run these films for weeks on release. While I absolutely love film myself, one can understand the difficulties and challenges of film distribution versus a much easier digital release that does not require all the extra costs and steps. For long time viewers, I think you guys have realized that our studio's changing a little bit. We're not fully finished, but you know, we were just looking for something new. Just like our sponsor Squarespace's new fluid engine that allows you to even further customize your website without the hassle of extra coding. <laughs> Who needs that? Start off with an easy to use template and customize every single design by clicking, dragging, and expanding in any direction. Setting up an online store, accepting appointments from your clients, showing off your portfolios, and so many more easy to set up features on Squarespace makes it a lifesaver for any creative looking to expand their business. But don't listen to me. Go try it out for yourself right now by heading to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash frame voyager to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Now let's get back to some film. There's no movement in movies at all. They are still pictures. But when shown at 24 frames a second, through a light bulb, it creates the illusion of movement. So thus, as opposed to a recording device, when you're watching a movie, a film print, you are watching an illusion. And to me, that illusion is connected to the magic of movies. So far in this video, we've really only talked about whether or not a film could still be used for principal filming. But the more difficult proposition is even seeing those films in a non-digital screening. The first digital projection takeover of theaters actually happened before the millennium shift, with George Lucas again being one of the pioneers, presenting the digitally produced Star Wars The Phantom Menace on the big screen, making the use of digital projection. However, back in 1999, finding a theater that projected that movie digitally was harder than finding an IMAX theater that projects 1570 reels today. Uh, we started with Phantom Menace, we got into four theaters. Three years later, we did Attack of the Clones, but we ended up in about 80 theaters. We'd got Pixar had helped us because they also do digital films, and Pixar had made it from the four theaters that I started with up to about 18 theaters. And then we've now taken it from 18 to 80, and I'm hoping it will continue to progress. Not only because it's the best way, if it's shot digitally, it's the best way to project it. A goal for Lucasfilm was to introduce digital technology in cinemas and to aid the proliferation of this new projection technology, bringing with it innovations that would be beneficial for theaters and theater goers alike. Eventually installing 400 screens in the United States and Canada together by mid-2006, Digital cinema systems would continue to proliferate and multiply, especially due to the process of sharing digital media being a relatively simple process when compared to distributing a film on film. To run in film for 57 years, and for most theaters it's $70,000 per projector. So for a drive-in theater, with our case, it's $140,000. They say a lot of small independent theaters are going to go out of business because of it. The smaller seasonal theaters probably are going to close. There are a lot of economic interests wanting to sell new equipment, wanting to 
you know, evolve the industry uh, and, and make money that way. And they've had a very powerful voice. By the end of 2017, it had been reported that over 98% of movie screens worldwide were digital. But that number likely still diminishes each year with really only select IMAX theaters showing in 70 millimeter film and a select number of boutique theaters that get smaller in number every year. Now, recently, IMAX CEO Richard Gelfand said that as for the projectors, they are all dated. There's currently no new generation of those projects. But we are thinking about more opportunities regarding this. For instance, building up new 70 millimeter projectors and branding other 70 millimeter projectors with IMAX. We are aggressively searching for more opportunities in that regard. This seems at first like a great sign and coming off of a massive stocks boost and revenue surge during Oppenheimer that saw up to 97.5% of all seats for the 70 millimeter showings full, maybe there's there is some hope for more films in the future to be shown in 70 millimeter film. The issue still being that it's incredibly rare for a film to be made with an IMAX camera. Even with those 30 IMAX showings for Oppenheimer, there were rampant problems and shutdowns in the middle of the film, with these issues completely canceling showings altogether until they could fix the problem. Fans hoping to see Oppenheimer in the rare 70 millimeter IMAX format here in Grand Rapids were disappointed today when the film reel was damaged. According to a post from Celebration Cinemas on Facebook, there was a technical issue during a showing today. And those able to actually fix the issues with these aging projectors are becoming a rare breed themselves. The number of people who know how to run a film projector and run maintenance on projectors from companies that are often not even in existence anymore have been steadily dropping since the turn of the millennia. For context, in 1940, there were over 30,000 projectionists worldwide, but by 2015, there were fewer than 5,000 projectionists nationally, with limited jobs even available for it to be a sustainable career for many. I got the call because um, not a lot of people know how to actually like thread film anymore. You know, it was exciting and a bit nerve wracking because I haven't done it in so long. Having been out of the business for 17 years, Moss had to relearn the ropes for a new job. And training the next generation of projectionists can be quite a difficult one as it's not as easy as hitting play and letting it go. It takes six to eight hours to assemble the nearly three hours of footage onto a single reel. It weighs about 600 pounds. Interstellar is 49 reels. Uh, it has special clamps on the edge to make sure we get the very most uh, out of the platter. A projectionist also really makes or breaks the movie experience. Color and vibrancy, focus, sharpness, and even the integrity of the film itself can all be affected by the quality, work, or mistakes of a projectionist. Being a good projectionist requires a lot of experience, which is another price to pay for for smooth film screenings in the theater. The necessity to pay for skilled labor who inspect, load, and run the reels that are projected on the big screen, which is a far cry from what one needs to do a digital projection. Load up a file and press play. And it's a little bit more involved with that with some of these, but it's, it's not as dedicated of a process. One question stands though. How do things look now in the post-film era? Directors, consumers, and theaters alike embrace digital over analog ways, and with ever-increasing display resolutions, high-end televisions, and streaming services, a whole bunch of keen film lovers may prefer watching blockbusters in the comfort of their own home, to the point where theaters and directors alike are thinking about how to best lure those enthusiasts out of their home and back to the cinemas. There's a spirit of optimism, there's a spirit of uh, film having uh, a wonderful future and, and great potential, and there's a lot of excitement around it. Uh, a lot of excitement from filmmakers and exhibitors and, and everybody else in terms of continuing to give audiences a reason to leave their homes and come together in a movie theater to experience a story. Whether an audience member appreciates a film being projected on film also depends on the individual. If they even care about the format the film is delivered on and if the film theaters are even really an option for the moviegoer. Is it the end of film? Yeah, I guess it is. Is it the end of film? What do you think? I think celluloid is still gonna be a choice. So, is film lost? Is it a dying art that is slowly coming to an end? And with the release of Oppenheimer, we may have seen a glimmer of hope, with many calling for IMAX to upgrade the projection systems and install them in more theaters. IMAX CEO Richard Gelfond said that, we again proved that IMAX can drive results in virtually any business environment thanks to our global scale asset light model. The accelerated pace of system signings and installations we're seeing globally this year are a very positive long-term growth indicator 
for our business. Whether or not that means a larger future for film or it means a larger commitment to more digital for IMAX is still to be seen. But what we can see right now is the explosive production of Oppenheimer and its use of black and white film right here.